some core philosophical ideas. The should know part is the cause of much trouble. People can live a full life without ever explicitly thinking about any philosophy at all. It is like people can breathe air without ever having to know what they intake from the breath and how many times they inhale per minute. They still adhere to some philosophy of life, but without an urge to advertise their knowledge on Quora or some other shouting forum. If it is a question of teaching philosophy to students who explicitly try to put their ideas into words, then there are a few ideas that one might regard as highly important. I have really no competence to say what philosophy is. My formal training was in economics, with which came a bit of math. But since I carried a head, it had some habit of thinking. From that habit, I have some ideas. I support Socrates and Russell in that the knowledge of the objective world comes from recognizing obvious facts of experience and then thinking step by step about their necessary implications. To apply their ideas, I need ontology, epistemology, methodology and rhetoric to complete my paradigm of knowledge. The gist of ontology to me is that one cannot possibly gain knowledge of something that does not exist, although one may have no trouble forming a belief about something entirely imaginary. From my youth, I had an entirely imaginary neighbor who was a nymph that seduced me, and I had no trouble exciting myself thinking about her. And I seem to daydream quite routinely about an imaginary world where my economic policies assure prosperity, security, and peace. I have no trouble believing my dreams. But I know that imagination is not reality. The gist of epistemology to me is that no objective reality can come into existence without cause and that the cause is both necessary and sufficient to give rise to the reality. And then I take it for granted that the concrete phenomenal world is full of impurities so that beyond the necessary and the sufficient conditions for the occurrence of something, unnecessary accidents are present. These accidents mislead us. The gist of methodology to me is to apply the test of necessity and sufficiency. The test of necessity allows us to throw away the accidental impurities that hide and obfuscate the essence of reality. And the big hassle is to assure sufficiency. Experiments are needed to ascertain that the alleged necessary conditions are also sufficient to generate the phenomenon. The great success of natural science lies in experimental assertion of sufficiency leading to technology in practical applications. The great failure of social sciences come from the failure to ascertain sufficiency of causation. The gist of rhetoric to me is that my arguments will ultimately win if firstly they stand on indisputable facts of experience, and secondly if the causal meanings attached to those facts are irrefutable on grounds of logic. I wish that all those who want knowledge would share these ideas. Philosophy is theoretical. It is someone's thoughts and perception. Truth is what we are attempting to discover on our spiritual paths. Philosophy is not the truth. It's an idea of the truth. From the time of creation, the concept of a superior being, force, creator or God was felt by the inner consciousness of man. As man's ability to develop concepts increased, formal framework about this superior force came into being. The mind, imagination, perceptions and revelations led to the birth of religions throughout the world. Fast forward to the present, and we have religions, philosophies and beliefs which evolved from the early days. One might question if these beliefs are based on the truth. Are they truly representing knowledge of that superior force which is not unknown to our inner eternal self? The answer is that if it was true knowledge of the Supreme, it would all be the same. Some use the example of blind people being asked to describe an elephant. Each person is permitted to touch a different part of its body. The purport is that different beliefs are partial knowledge. This reasoning is fallacious because every religion's doctrine and dogma are not partial knowledge in the whole picture of the Supreme. The picture of the elephant would be whole by adding each person's perspective. Whereas, religions differ on major aspects of a Supreme. There is no room for consensus. What can one infer from how simple acceptance of a Supreme has evolved into splintered organizations purporting to be sole representative of a Supreme? People should understand that the existence of a Supreme is not in question. Question how a pure concept has evolved into financial powerhouses, with control of our emotions, aspirations and faith. Question which part of one's faith should be used as the next rung on the ladder to realization. Question if our scriptures are truly the word of God, or they have been tampered with along the way. 
The idea which is key to enlightenment is to learn how to distill your faith and remain with its purest essence. Learn to see the inner soul not the body. Stop discrimination. Give up a religion and embrace God. Centuries of being conditioned have made us slaves to a false hope of salvation. Membership is not a passport to heaven. This is a line of thought which might lead to enlightenment. But it is by no means the truth. It is a perception. We should be willing to let go in order to have free hands to catch the truth.